Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Refreshing Your Classroom Library. I'm Katie Hostman, Director of Products at BookSource. And as many of you already know, BookSource partners with pre-K to 12 educators to build classroom libraries that enrich literacy instruction and inspire a love of reading. We're passionate about getting the right books into the hands of readers through classroom libraries. And we are here today to share our passion and insights with you. Today, I'm joined by Steve Allen and Rachel Bailey, who are going to share their title insights and expertise on refreshing classroom libraries. Hi, uh, I'm Steve Allen. I am the trade show and event specialist here at BookSource. I was a teacher for 15 years prior to moving to St. Louis three years ago, and I worked on the sales team and now work in trade shows. Hi, I'm Rachel Bailey. I'm the digital support specialist here at BookSource. So I work on our customer care team, uh, helping everyone with questions and orders. And also uh, I'm the expert support specialist for our BookSource classroom program, uh, which you'll hear a little bit more about later. I also come from a family of teachers and am myself a total book nerd. And like I said, I'm Katie Hostman. I'm the director of product here at BookSource. Before my eight years at BookSource, I was the seventh grade come arts teacher for a smaller district, and it was so much fun. Mm -hmm. So I still get to work in books every day and, and share that love. So during today's webinar, we'll cover the why, when, and how of refreshing your classroom library. Why to do it, when is the best time to do it, and provide some tips and ideas for the how. So don't forget, um, as we move through the webinar, you can put questions in the chat box. There's a little reminder up there. But while we're presenting, feel free to just pop those questions right in. And then keep in mind that we will be emailing out these slides and the recording of this webinar to everyone who registered. So please don't feel like you have to write everything down. Um, so now let's just jump right in and talk about why we refresh those classroom libraries with Steve. So there's lots of reasons, obviously, to refresh your classroom library. These are just some of the highlights that we wanted to share with you. Um, always a good idea to improve choice, access, and organization. Um, it's important to keep those kids engaged, as you all know. Um, books tend to walk away during the school year, so we might need to refresh some of them that have disappeared. Books get um, worn out from being well-loved. Um, mainly, though, students' interests change, and we mm -hmm. want to keep them engaged. So. I think about, you know, I read Hardy Boys, my kids um, read Franklin, and now kids are reading Wimpy Kid and things today. Um, pop culture will have a big effect on their interest. We, you know, we want to make sure we keep books on Legos if that what kids are interested in, or, or um, Minecraft, things like that. And your pop population of your classroom will shift. You may have uh, interest levels that adjust a little bit. You may have reading ability levels that adjust a little bit. And um, you also may have the demographics change. So all things you want to keep in mind about when to refresh. And we think you should do it as often as you can. I mean, <laughs> we're in the book business. We love books. Um, I know that there are teachers that are able to budget for a monthly stipend to be able to refresh on a monthly basis. That's not going to happen for everybody, unfortunately. Um, so what I used to do is I kept a post-it list right next to my check-in, check-out computer. And when kids had a book that they wanted to read but we didn't have, they would add it to the post-it and they would stick it on the wall right by the computer. You could also keep a running just a list of a yellow legal pad. Um, you can keep a wish list online. We have a tool online where you can keep a list of books that you want to purchase. Um, there's lots of options electronically to be able to keep a wish list. Um, but it is important um, to make sure you're always keeping in mind what the students want to read. Um, always a good time when funding becomes available. Grants are great. PTO funds are great. Um, sometimes we need to do it when curriculum changes. A lot of school districts are starting to have science um, requirements in their ELA time or social study requirements in their ELA time. You might need to pick up some titles for that. We have lots of great um, nonfiction titles that would accommodate that. Um, you might realize you need a great mentor text on a new topic as you're teaching something new. And of course, at the end of the year and right when you're on summer break where you can think a little bit more are also great times. So 
So now my favorite, how do you fresh, refresh your classroom library? There are lots of ways. But first, really assess your goals. So how have you and your students been using your classroom library? Are there new ways you can use it moving forward? So with that, um, what are you trying to accomplish? Are you trying to increase student engagement, improve diversity? That's a big popular topic right now. Align with new standards or curriculum, or maybe just ensure a better variety of titles and create a more inviting space. So we'll address really all of these, especially the inviting space, the organization, how to improve diversity, some great titles. And I do wanna mention we have great titles suggested. The cover images are all over the screen. I'll get into some specifics. But this is a P to 12 webinar. So if you feel like you don't see enough titles that you are hoping to get out of this, we have some resources throughout the webinar, but also at the end, um, a resource for you to reach out and get some more title suggestions. So we do want to make sure you have those title recommendations. Just know that this is, it covers a wide range of interests and We'll try to make sure that you have, it's something for everyone, but maybe not just a ton for everyone. So looking at assessing your goals, a lot of people use classroom li libraries just for independent reading, and that's awesome. But you can use it and kind of keep your tools in your classroom library too. So some teachers keep their read alouds behind their desks. I get it, a lot of them are expensive. <laughs> Uh, but if you have an opportunity and you do want to keep them behind your desk to get a second copy, it's nice to have those accessible for the kids. Maybe they want to follow up. It's nice too with comprehension if they've already had it read aloud to them once, then they can look at the images more closely and, and be able to connect in that way. Then with the younger students, you probably do guided reading. Most of the time, the older students are doing book clubs. Again, with read alouds, you might have the comprehension strategies or your reading writing workshop. Getting into author and genre studies is so much fun. With intervention, that can look like a variety of different things in the classroom. Most of the time, it's just having a lot of different reading levels available, a wide variety of just readability across the text for students to be able to engage. And then, of course, the content areas, the STEM subjects and the social studies. So consider the physical organization. Think about how your titles are physically arranged in the classroom. Did this work for you well last year? Or is this the first year you're trying something new? Do you need any new containers or shelves, um, bin labels or shelf labels? These are some great pictures that teachers sent in. And really look at the different levels. We have from left to right here, um, elementary classroom, a middle school classroom in the middle, and then a secondary classroom. One thing that's nice is just seeing the bright colors, seeing how inviting everything is, seeing how organized everything is, and the different heights so the younger students can physically reach those books while you have the older students who are tall enough for the taller shelves. So the first picture, um, the book bins are labeled using DRA levels as well as various genres and topics. In the middle picture, the books are mostly organized by genre, but then you also have some nonfiction categories as well. And then the high school is also organized by genre and then author. And I do want to mention there's a little reminder circle that will have a download available for a toolkit with the free labels after this webinar. So it'll have um, labels that have suggested genres and then also editable labels so you can change them to what you want them to say. So again, more examples, two younger uh, elementary pictures and then a, a secondary picture. The elementary, if you look closely, it looks like they're organized by a guided reading level, but you see A, B, C. But when you read, it's author's last name, which I thought was a little bit counterintuitive in a younger classroom. Mm -hmm. But then I thought again that so many students love series. They love getting a favorite author and seeing more like it. So what a great way to start and encourage your young readers to, to find something they like and to organize your classroom that way. Sure. And especially if they're doing an author study, then they can connect that person to everything they've written. Already organized for you, just exactly. grab a bin. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> then in the middle, this teacher wrote a little preview, an excerpt from the book or a reason why she liked the book above. You can see the little signs pointing to the three titles on the top. This is just a fun way to encourage 
just excitement and talk about books. You could ask students to write what they liked sure. about the book and make it just a, an activity in the classroom. So I love that idea. And then this is just, I said, hashtag library goals. Um, this teacher has between 800 to 900 high interest titles for his 12th graders. So that's wonderful. Um, actually, I don't know if it's a man or a woman. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think it's, it, it's just a, Deborah. Oh, Deborah. Yeah. I see that. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, then it's just really well organized. You can see that the books are in good condition. They, they're all pretty bright colors. I know that after the year, some of them get kind of worn. And we'll talk about when to weave too at the end of the webinar. So adding new books. When you physically arrange your books, you've really touched them. You've taken the time to make observations and take inventory, whether, whether it's official or just informally. So think about what your students like to read and do, do you need to add more fresh titles? Here we have some really great suggestions. The Raina Telgemeier memoir series, Guts, is it just came out in September, so that's the third book in the series. Dog Man is already up to book number eight. We have Fetch 22, which is a great graphic novel. We sell tons of them, and that's for second to sixth grade interest levels. Jason Reynolds has a new book coming out, Look Both Ways, and it's for fifth to ninth graders, a great compilation of short stories. And then I threw in just a fun nonfiction um, killer style for fourth through seventh grade. It'll appeal to a lot of audiences, kids who like style, but also a fun gross out factor. It talks about uh, primary sources with pictures of medical journals and things like that. So it's really about how style has killed through the ages with the Mad Hatters and there's arsenic in green dye. It's, it's just an interesting read. Yeah. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> then do you have enough books in your classroom library? We've all heard the statistics. Fontes and Pinnell recommend having 300 to 600 books in your classroom library. And ILA, ALA, um, what, it was the International Reading Association, and now- Which is now ILA. ILA, yeah. Right. Um, and they suggest having seven books per child. So if you do the math in a standard classroom, that's going to be about 200, 250 books, give or take. So we're really pretty close to that, just depending on what you need, how often you can rotate. Those are good numbers. So do you have a good mix of fiction and nonfiction? Here's some great options and hopefully they, they reach across. So when you think of nonfiction, I don't want people just to think, oh, it's all animal books. When you think of fiction, I don't want people to think, oh, it's just all the same story. Cause there's a lot of variety, especially with diverse settings, diverse characters. Um, if you haven't looked at Yasmin yet, this is such a fun early chapter book for grades one to two. I Survived is so popular, grades two to five there. Zoe Sassafras is a fun series, already on book number seven, which is exciting. Then just a couple picture books. My Poppy Has a Motorcycle and the new Pigeon book. If you haven't read the Pigeon book, you really need to. They're if you're so a good. Pigeon fan, mm -hmm. this one is, is speaking to the fans. It's a great one. <laughs> then for the nonfiction there, Shout is Laurie Hulse Anderson's um, memoir that's in, in poetry. It's a, it's a novel in verse, really. Then we have a couple robots, meat-eating plants, food chains. The Max Axiom is a graphic novel that's a lot of fun for science. And then Trevor Noah, he has Born a Crime, but now it's the Young Readers edition is just out. And that's appropriate really for grades fifth grade and up. So it's nice to bring that access down to a lower grade level. And I love the way that some of these can transition students. So if you have a student who's a huge nonfiction fan, you know, the I Survive series is a great way to introduce them to some fiction. Mm -hmm. And if you have a graphic novel fan, uh, Max Axiom is a great way to introduce them to some nonfiction. I mean, it, the options have just exploded over the last decade. It, it's really a great opportunity for um, independent reading. And it's nice to see the meat eating plants is a great example because just the quality of photography has improved so much over the past few years, really. The publishing industry, they're using these beautiful high res pictures and it's captivating, just visually captivating, stunning. And in the digital time, kids are just used to seeing that. Sure. They mm -hmm. can identify what isn't high resolution and what is, and it makes books look dated. 
So not only are you looking at the information in your nonfiction, but really look at those images. And it's not just clothing anymore right. or technology that can date them. It's, it's really just the quality of the picture. For sure. And does your classroom library include newer titles? We were just talking about images and how that's important. Here's some great a ALA award winners. Just a lot of great diverse titles. We have, these are all appropriate really for that K to two, K to three environment. A couple can stretch down to preschool. So if you haven't checked those out, they're definitely worth checking out. And do your books support a wide range of reading abilities? Here in the, in the center, you'll have the picture of the guided reading circle. That's great. And I think a wonderful setting for students to be able to read at different levels. But off to the side, we have a couple examples of more of a secondary approach. We have the Shakespeare example or the Poe example, where you have the traditional text, but then you might have a graphic, graphic novel version or an adapted version. And it just makes these titles accessible for so many readers so they can read the same content, but also have, have the ability to have different reading levels. Really meet them where they are. Absolutely. Then do you have your content reading opportunities? This is where most people are like, these aren't exciting books. But I do want to emphasize that it's not just a book about art. It can be a book about something really exciting and incorporate art along with all of the other subjects. And so many can be cross-functional. For example, on the next slide, we have these beautiful picture books and they really serve cross-functional purposes. The Undefeated is just gorgeously illustrated and it's a poem. It was originally, a, they call it, describe it as a love letter to black life in the United States. And it's just, stunning, honestly, but it can teach history and it also has themes of grit and perseverance. So that's wonderful to call that out while you're teaching. You the, could use it for a biography section. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. The proudest blue is just a, a wonderful, again, just beautiful images, story of the Olympic fencer. It, it, let me pr pronounce it right. It's Hajj Mohammed. And this is a story about a memory from her youth, and it's fictionalized, but it is a great story. And it also has those themes of her SEL teaching, so social emotional learning about identity and bullies and how to deal with that and how to find your own self-worth. And I, I can't say enough good things about it. It's just, it's absolutely stunning. And that's great for P to three. And then Secret Engineer, this is a great story. It touches on the STEM um, elements. So actually the, the engineering behind some great drawings and photographs of the book Brooklyn Bridge, but also just a great story of women's history and how a woman was able to get involved there. And you have enough books with different structure and format. So I think we all hopefully think about the graphic novels, the chapter books, the novels in verse, picture books, yes, even for middle and high school, right. they love it. Read alouds or just reading them to themselves. But also the text features. Think about your glossaries, your headings, your timelines, maps. That's a good one with your graphs. And then primary source materials. And like we mentioned before, just those beautiful photographs, making sure that your books do have some captivating pictures. Here are a couple exciting new releases. Crossover has been out for a while, but just this last year it came out in paperback, which is wonderful to bring down that price point. But now just this year, Crossover as a graphic novel came out. So make sure to check that one out. And it's great for fifth grade through seventh grade. Um, and it is, it's interesting because it's Crossover originally as a novel in verse, but then to have that, yep. that graphic novel too is just a nice way to have different styles of the text assess accessible for students. And then The New Kids, a great new graphic novel, and it has wonderful themes. It's appropriate for third through seventh grade. It's about a child who starts a new prestigious private school, and he's one of the few kids of color in his school. So it's really about fitting in and finding your own identity, and it's, it's just a nice book. And at Bookstores, we really try to think about diversity all the time with all of our collection. And we encourage you to look for books where students can find um, titles they can relate to personally ex and expand their worldview. We think of inclusion and diversity as truly looking at 
a lot of different categories. It's not just one thing. It's about abilities, ages, cultural, cultural experiences, ethnicities, family structures, genders, global perspectives, orientation, and socioeconomic status, as, and more. It's really about reflecting society in your classroom and making sure that students have that, that personal relationship and that worldview. So if you want more information specifically on diversity, we've hit it pretty hard this year. These resources will be available once the information for the webinar is sent out, so you'll have these links. The first section is we had an inclusive classroom library checklist that focuses on some of the main points of having your classroom library, but then goes through very specific diverse authorship, protagonists, really nice questions, and an extensive checklist that you can walk through in your library. And then also there's a webinar that co corresponds with discovering new and exciting diverse books. And that'll give you more title recommendations and point to that checklist as well. Then there's the three-part PD webinar series. And that's all about how you can evaluate your classroom library and incorporate more diversity. And that's really meaty. It's a three-part series on, on that. If you want a quick fix, <laughs> These are my favorite collections. You might know the hashtag own voices coined by Corinne Dalvis. We created 30 books for each grade level band. So it's 30 books for kindergarten through second, three to five, six to eight, and then nine to 12. And these all really focus on that authentic experience of the author and then coming through in that title. We're proud of these books. I think they're a great addition to any classroom. And it's just, it's great if you need, you're just looking for some books. Then my favorite. <laughs> in order to bring in new books, you need to remove books. And I know they're precious gems and they all cost money and we're all aware of that. But at some point, it's time to move on. It's time mm -hmm. to assess those books and really look for books that, of course, include just outdated content, especially if it's inaccurate but books that might include misrepresentation or discriminatory content. Old books that are published more than 15 years, unless they're considered classics, there are classics. We have some good examples here that are not classics. Um, the cell phone book, unfortunately cell phones don't have antennas anymore. This world of work that makes me not wanna ever go to work, that computer is older than I am. And then the history of computers here. I like the concept, but the problem is it shows the historic computer and then I think what's supposed to be the new computer that's not new anymore and nobody uses compact discs. So just look at the books, think about what your kids are using and try to make sure that if it's about especially technology, um, science, that type of very rapidly changing subject matter, make sure that that's really updated and exciting. And you know, sometimes refreshing can really just be um trading books in and out. Absolutely. You know, if you have some favorite books that um, you really want to give, have your students give a try, put them in there. And mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with leaving them in there for three, four, five months. And if mm -hmm. they don't work, move them out, keep them next year and, and rotate them back in. Um, maybe you have another teacher that you can do a, a little yeah. rotation with um, to, to keep that refreshing too and do it on a budget. Mm -hmm. And then books that are physically damaged, I understand just wear and tear happens. That's not what we're talking about. If it's missing a cover or a significant amount of pages, that's when it's, it's time to retire. And if you have a beloved title, but it doesn't get read by students, just take it home and enjoy it at home. And then you can keep the books that kids want to read in the classrooms. And Steve has a great tip with how students can get involved. Well, I'm actually kind of borrowing the tip because it was, <laughs> um, it was offered up by one of our contributors, um, Ashley Rose, who's a teacher in Washington, D.C. She works with middle school students, and she's actually also working on her um, media library certification. Um, she shared um, some writings with us about how she upgraded her library. And she started to hear um, when she was a new teacher that her kids just couldn't find any good books. She didn't have any good books in her library. Mm -hmm. And she, I love it how she says, I knew I wasn't doing everything right my first year of teaching, but I did have good books in my mm -hmm. library. And it turns out that she, you know, as a new teacher, she leaned on traditional setup to where she had bins for her middle grade students that were um, designated by guided reading level. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out those students didn't want to dig through those bins to look for a sure. title that interests them. 
that was um, you know, intimidating and it wasn't inviting to just go by a letter. Um, so she um, asked them questions. She wanted to get them involved um, and help them find the books that they wanted to read. Uh, so she did, she set up a Saturday um, workshop and they brainstormed and they came up with a new way to organize her library based on how they found a book on what they wanted to read based on what they felt. And this next slide um, kind of shows some of the questions she asked, but I apologize, the font's small on the one in the green, but what they came up with is so engaging. And I mean, I wish I was still in the classroom to steal some of these. Um, if you can see it, um, they say the struggle is real, um, in for a scare, um, got the giggles, great titles and, or great subjects to help kids find books based on what they what feeling they want to get out of the books. Um, and she said it completely changed the engagement level of her students. Mm -hmm. I love the figuring out how to be yourself. That's such an, yeah. a great phrase. And it's not coming of age or something right. a little more stilted that I think we'd be quick to put on there. Well, but. And she tells a great story about one of the students said, I wanted to read books that made me feel the way I did when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And Ashley said, oh, great, we'll call that been nostalgic. And the kid was like, uh, what is that? And so <laughs> she said, never mind, I'll just do what you said, because we have to remember that if we want to engage them yeah. and, and keep them involved, we have to respect their their point of view. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a great series. You can find the first two se sections on our banter blog, which is a link on our website, and then we'll be sharing the next two in upcoming Tuesdays. So now, if that's not enough to think about, we do have a tool that I'm here to talk to you guys about um, that's going to help with managing your classroom library. So we here at Bookstores know that you cannot possibly do it all on your own. So we've created a free tool um, called Bookstores Classroom. So it's our free online tool to help you organize and manage that classroom library totally free. Um, some of you may know this uh, already as Classroom Organizer, the artist formerly known as Classroom Organizer. It's gotten an update in the last few months, a nicer look, a few updated features, um, but it's that same free tool to really help you manage and make the most out of your classroom library and help get your students a little bit more engaged. And how much is it, Rachel? Free 99. <laughs> <laughs> Entirely free. Uh, so what it can do, you can add all your books into your library so you have them cataloged on, in this online system. We know research shows that no matter what you do, you're going to lose books here and there. About 10% of your books over a year will either walk away, they might you know, walk away with a student who needs it more than you do, or they might just get damaged or they might just need to be weeded out. But this way you can at least try to keep better track. Fewer lost books is good for everyone. Um, you can also sort and tag all your books. So if I was in Ashley Rose's classroom, I could tag all those books with Got the Giggles, with how I felt when I was young. You can create those as the locations, as the genres. I, in my classroom library, have them tagged on these are on the red shelf and then they're part of this genre. They have all those tags makes things way easier to find, easier to keep track of. And your students can then search, well, what is all of the books in that genre, in that hashtag squad goals genre? Mm -hmm. That's my favorite one. And they can see that list. And then all of the information that we do, it, that we collect at Bookstores, all of those official publisher annotations, official leveling info, all of that is in there for you as well. So I even just a few days ago was talking to a teacher about her classroom library. She has 2,000 books, which just wow. blew my mind. She's hitting three different grades and she's got it open to all of her students. So she has this huge, wonderful, robust library, but she can't possibly know every single title in there and what kind of subjects are in there. This helps her. She can get all that information without having to sit and read 2,000 middle-aged novels. No way. Um, so now she has this resource. And then on the student side of it, your students can go in. Go to the next one. Your students can go in and check those books in and out. They can search for things. They can also then, when they return books to your library, leave ratings and reviews for each other. So I can go in and say, oh, Katie and Steve both rated this book five stars and they left awesome reviews. I would probably like it too. Really get that word of mouth going about what's in your library, get your students engaged. And writing reviews is another really good way to kind of cross those skills. It's writing as well as reading. 
And now we also have this new feature, which I think is the coolest thing. So we have all of that information and we've built for Bookstores Classroom this new free feature called Library Lens to help you identify the gaps in your library. So when you're looking at, it's time for me to refresh my library, I've got some funding and I've got some time, but I have no idea what I want, this can help you identify, oh, I maybe really need some books that incorporate math or some of those particular categories of diversity. And it'll go through all of that stuff we've been talking about. How big is your library? Do you have a good split of fiction and nonfiction? Are you hitting a lot of those diversity categories? And even since we have all of that book knowledge that we have worked very hard in our collection development team to cultivate and to make sure it's accurate, it'll give you title recommendations of, hey, here's five or six books, or here's a small collection that we have at bookstores available that'll help you hit some of those gaps and really start filling those areas that you want to fill in your library. It's a very cool tool, and you can even get really down into the, into the data and look at graphs of your library and nerd out. It's great. Um, obviously, a lot of that can be overwhelming, <laughs> but don't panic. We can help. We can. Um, we work with 22,000 titles, about 25,000 titles. I mean, we can't keep track of all of that. No we have a great team here at Bookstores called the Literacy Account Team, where they will help you. They'll work with any budget. They'll work with any interest level, grade level. Um, they'll help you work. Um, check those boxes that you need to. So if you know you need biography and you know you need graphic novels, they can help you find graphic novels that are biographies. I mean, they are just a really smart team. They have experience both in the classroom and in um, book knowledge, and they're just really helpful. And all you have to do is drop them an email at literacy at bookstores.com and they will respond and help you find what you need. And it can be even as simple as I teach third grade. My students are mostly reading on level, but I have some that would be below level and my budget this, and they exactly. work with any budget, any, any guidelines that you need help with. Yep. And that is also a free service. So yes. Them, yes. them building the list for you is a free service. Mm -hmm. So more about the classroom refresher toolkit that's coming and this will be emailed after the, the webinar. Again, it'll be next week that it's coming um, for you to have those links. So what's included? You'll have the classroom library refresh checklist there, and that's a great way just to quickly go through, and it's what we covered on the webinar today to assess your classroom library. Some fun printable bin labels to help you organize and decorate. They can be shelf labels too. And like I said, you can edit those and customize. And then just fun bookmarks and spark some excitement with your students. So now has Come the time for questions. So hopefully we got some good questions in the chat box. And if not, uh, if you haven't had a chance to ask, please go ahead and submit your questions now. And it looks like we did get a question through email right before the webinar started. So let's see, it says, do I level my genre baskets? I want to step away from a leveled library, but should books be grouped by author, genre, topic? How should they be grouped? Well, I think we touched on that a little bit. I was um, fortunate to see Fanta Sentinel speak, and they do emphasize that their leveling system was really meant to be a tool for educators, mm -hmm. just one way for teachers to help match uh, books with their readers. But with, when you think about trying to go to a bookstore, you don't shop by reading level, and it's hard. And the, the article that Steve mentioned by Ashley Rose, she said she wasn't even really sure. She was like, oh, that's a level O, or was it a P? Like, yeah. Shoot, let me dig through this bin for a second. So I think that's a system that does work for some teachers, but I would encourage, if you're going to use levels, maybe banded leveled baskets, and then you can still use genre as well, or another fun, the way you make, it, it makes you feel. I don't sure. think I'd want to dive into a book of sad, <laughs> or a bit right. of sad books, but some students will. Right, and, and you be creative about um, doing that banding. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe mm -hmm. you call something like starter scary stories for your, for your lower level um, scary stories. Mm -hmm. You come up with a new name for your next mm -hmm. level. Um, so you don't have to point to that ability level specifically by your reading level, but it gives the kids a little parameter to search through. Absolutely. And the great news with independent reading is it doesn't always have to be a reaching book. Sometimes you just want some book candy. Sometimes sure. you just want to sit back and read. One of my favorite um, types of books is a graphic novel. And I, I understand that's not rigorous, but I love it. Yeah. <laughs> and the content can still be pushing you. It, it doesn't always have to be the level itself that's pushing you. Maybe it's the content. Absolutely. Or if it's a content that I'm really interested in, I could probably read way above my reading level. 
for sure. If it's something I find really boring, it doesn't matter how on level it is. Absolutely. Especially when you know a subject matter and you can already engage in that way. Absolutely. It's, it's wonderful to have. Okay. So no other questions have come in. None. <laughs> Well, the good news is we'll still be available even after when you're watching the recorded at literacy mm -hmm. at booksource.com. So if you think of questions or something didn't get answered, feel free to reach out. Again, that's literacy at booksource.com. But thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. We appreciate you and what you do. Um, Booksource is here to support you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks.